All right. Greetings, guys. Welcome back to Black Bear News, where everything is connected, and we are discussing <coughs> climate change, news of the, news of the, the day, and, uh, you know, all, all things you know, loosely and tightly connected to climate change. Um, but welcome. Thanks for the... Uh, Thanks for, for being flexible on the time change, guys. We are live on Rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N.com. Please come hang out with me on Rockfin, uh, where we all may end up eventually. Uh, so I wanted to bring, want to have a discussion. <clears throat> what happened was, um, uh, Lord Hugh left a couple comments on the Roger Hallam video. Well, he left one this morning about a Reddit post, and I, and I thought it was really interesting, and so I asked him to come on and discuss it today. So we're going to bring in uh, Lord Hugh. Uh, you are on. How you doing? Hey, hi, Kevin. <clears throat> Thanks for coming on. Um, so, yeah, we... Uh, you know, you, 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 you posted something about, uh, well, you posted something on Reddit and you, you posted that to the comments and, and kind of basically drawing the distinction between a state run, you know, what Roger Hallam was talking about as a state run response to climate change as opposed to a maybe a more um, organic local, you know, local people powered, community powered, you know, I'm r roughly, you know, kind of summing it up um, as such. But uh, so, you know, and I, I think that's interesting. I think it's an interesting discussion because it seems to be a big, a big point of discussion on the internet, or you know, people who are speaking freely about what's what's happening as far as uh, the response to COVID and the response to climate change and it becoming this kind of technocratic authoritarian, you know, top-down control, you know, uh, response to, to both problems. And people are, are concerned that, you know, climate change will be used in, as an excuse to kind of shoehorn this uh, response to coronavirus. And there are lots, you know, there's lots of different aspects and nuances to this. Uh, but anyways, uh, if you could just, you know, basically roughly sum up what your your thoughts on that were <clears throat> or uh you know what your the your your intent of the reddit post and then maybe we can just kind of go from there <clears throat> yeah so what it boils down to is really how much human agency you think we have in the climate crisis so if people think that there's a lot of scope for human action and intervention in climate mitigation then uh, you can make the case to say, well, this is a huge global problem. Therefore, it needs a huge global government and authoritarian solution. Sure. I'm more of the kind of um, school of thought that says we haven't got that much human agency. We haven't got that much control of it. Uh, and that comes from a number of things. It's like the Michael J. Mann thing that says, you know, like, but we still have human agency. And I'm saying like, but do we? You know, it's, it's this old narrative, the, the, uh, Jared Diamond says it. He says, like, you know, these were problems caused by humanity. Therefore, they things that can be solved by humanity. And that logic is just completely flawed. That's like saying, you know, humans drove off the cliff so we can see within our power to drive back on the cliff. It's like, no, it isn't. <laughs> We've driven off a cliff. We've destabilized the climate. So... The part of this narrative is a gradualist narrative that there's this long, slow graph and there's, you know, as we do stuff, you know, you know we can undo it and stuff. And it's like, no, that's not how the world system works. It's a complex system and you must think of it more like a spinning top. So we've destabilized it. And I can tell you is, you know, I spent most of my life working with systems and modeling them on computers and stuff. And I can tell you that once you destabilize a complex system, you can't patch it up and put it back together again. It's a Humpty Dumpty thing, right? So you can't uh, just intervene to mitigate a destabilized top once it's uh, spinning out of control. So the idea that, you know, this is something that we can patch up and we can all work together uh, to do 
uh, doesn't doesn't follow. And then on top of that is it's a human caused problem. So you you asking the very cause of the problem to fix it. It's like asking the disease to make somebody healthy again. But it's our thinking and our engineering and all these things put one on top of the other that got us here. So how engineering gets us out of it just doesn't follow logically. So that's pretty much the basis of my disagreement with this human agency thing. Right. <clears throat> well, I, I, so you are of the mind that basically there is it, there are th some things we can do. I mean, because you did propose, you know, I, I think you've proposed a few ideas as far as like toppling industri industrial civilization or top toppling the economic system. Um, so, do, I mean, do you think we have the agency to do things like that, you know? Um, you know? Yeah, so, so my thinking on these things comes from, you know, I've been a pilot and um, you know, a sailor and stuff. And so when you work with complex machines like airplanes and stuff, it was the same with the Apollo program. They had a general rule of thumb that these things, they get into modes, uh, particularly computer systems. They get into these complex modes of failure. Now, you can't analyze them and pick them apart and try and fix them. Uh, basically, everybody knows what you do with a computer system. You just reboot it. <laughs> Right. And this, they came to the same conclusion on, on Apollo. Uh, in uh, pilots are, are taught this, that they're saying like, when all hell breaks loose, the best thing to do is nothing. Is you you just got to stop and hope that it stabilizes. And a complex system, often if it's not tipped over, you know, um, uh, if it's homeostatic and it can actually return to stability, it, it can sometimes do it on its own. But w w a rookie mistake in, in a plane when you, you know, get one of those situations that builds where the engines are on fire and you're out of fuel, <laughs> right. basically everything's going wrong and the plane is depressurizing is, 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 uh, is not to make it worse. It's very easy mm. to make it worse by trying to second guess it and making mistakes. You, you, you're get, experimenting as you go. In. Right. I guess and a good so, analogy would be like if a car is, if you're skidding on the ice, uh, you don't want to slam the brakes on, right? But you don't want to. You, but you want to stop. You want to take your foot off the gas, right? So you you want to yeah. stop going the way you're going, but you don't want to exacerbate the problem by well, well, you know. With with one caveat, you know, if you're doing something, so so in other words, you know, if if you say in an aircraft, you open up the mixture and make the mixture richer and richer, and suddenly all hell breaks loose. Right. Then you'd be a fool to just take your hands off there you'd say like okay I'll, I'll dial the mixture back right and then everything might not come back into kilter for a while but you're better off just undoing what you last did right and so basically you're saying well we started the industrial revolution all hell broke loose within you know since 1750 yeah so basically then what you have to do is you have to stop you have to unwind all of that just just basically stop whatever you were doing right and then see but if you get into stuff like uh, geoengineering and stuff, it's it's a fatal rookie mistake on a complex system. So, yeah. so there might be agency, but uh, you don't want to start hacking the a complex system like the Earth. We, I mean, we haven't got any any. Yeah. For for one thing, we don't have any trial models, so you can't test out a theory on everything. Basically, every trial is your is your error, and we can't have any errors. We've only got one Earth. Right. So it's, it's a fool's errand to, to even start down that point of view. But you can do something like stop industrial civilization. And that could be done fairly easily. And it could be done involuntarily as well right. by a small group of people. Right. Well, so, you know, on, on one hand, I agree with Roger Hallam's assessment that, there, you know, it's it, we're going to have to have some kind of overarching response right so you know if if the system just breaks down on its own right the economy crashes or industrial civilization just collapses that's going to be a lot of it's going to be a lot of pain and suffering right so if you you know if you want to if you want to reduce pain and suffering you really have to have a managed you know drawdown and obviously it, it, the 
uh, likelihood that we're going to all agree to this managed drawdown or agree to the idea that this is what we have to do is very, you know, very unlikely. Um, however, you know, I see that as kind of the probably the only way forward is a managed, you know, we have to understand what we're doing and understand that we have to undo the last thing we did or undo the last couple of things we did, right? So we can, you know, we could chop away, you know, like right now it's pretty, pretty uh, widely accepted that fossil fuel industry is not, not a good thing. Bad characters, bad actors, right? So let's, you know, fossil fuel industry, go away, right? That has its, you know, that has its implications on the rest of the planet, right? So if we do, t uh, I, you know, we want the fossil fuel industry to go away, but people don't really understand how, how in, you know, entrenched we are the fossil, in the fossil fuel economy, right? So um, even something that, that, that kind of basic is going to require a lot more education of the, you know, of the masses, right? Because... If you say, let's take away the fossil fuel industry, let's shut them down, well, then you're shutting down, you're shutting down your, you know, you're shutting down the economy, you're shutting down getting food, you're shutting down shipping, you're shutting down consumer, you know, you're shutting down a lot more than cars, <laughs> right? You know, are you, so, um, yeah, so as far as like a managed collapse, if you're, if you're taking away, you know, sections of the, of the economy that are, you know, supposedly contributing to the, to our destruction or demise, you know, it's got much more wider implications about what, how that's going to affect everything that we do. Right. So, um, so yeah, so having like a state controlled, a state, uh, sponsored, managed degrowth or managed so something response to climate change is, I think it ha actually has to have a lot more, unless it's really fascist, Unless it's really totalitarian, it's going to have to have a lot more, um, ed you know, education involved or, you know, there's going to have to be more information involved in, in telling people what's going on, right? So. Yeah, I, I think we're, um, we're on the short fuse. So I don't think we have time for things like education and consensus uh, and things like that. So I think Roger Hallam agrees with that. Um, so some people would say that uh, Xi Jinping has a lot more options to deal with with climate change than say Boris Johnson or Biden because it's a totalitarian system and they can do by diktat what you can't do in a liberal democracy. But if you look at what Xi Jinping is doing, he's, he doesn't have the autonomy or the agency that you would credit uh, totalitarian dictatorship. He knows that his head is based on just having six or seven percent growth in China. And if he doesn't right. deliver on six or seven percent growth, he, his head's going to be on a block. So it's not quite as easy as people think. And that's the one thing. The other thing is, I think the timeline is very, very sure. So yeah. I agree with Roger that basically we, we're screwed. It's baked in. Uh, that there is going to be a collapse. I mean, we're going to get to three or four degrees Celsius and a lot sooner than people think, as you know. <laughs> I right. don't have to describe that to this audience. Right. But uh, I mean, I think we're talking blue ocean events, I think I think sooner than, than Roger Hallam. So I think maybe uh, the ocean scientists that observational ocean scientists in the Arctic say like 2025 is their, their best bet. So yeah. uh, things unravel very quickly. So the idea that you can mass educate people and then who is going to do this? I mean, you can say should, 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 but I mean, who, who's going to do this mass education um, and, and why? Why does it matter that the average person thinks this or that? Because, the, I mean, are they going to change because of education? I think Roger Hallam is right on that. Is, education doesn't change people. Yeah, well, I, you know, in my mind, and, and so I know this is a, you know, not a great example, but I've been saying this a lot uh, over the last year, that the response to COVID, you know, a lot of people are upset about the response to COVID. They see it as, you know, they see it as an overreach of state power or, you know, lockdowns and stay at home orders and all that. But the thing is, is that the population agrees to this because information is put out in a very, you know, Here's, a, here's the problem. This is what we have to do. You know, here's the response to the problem. 
and it's if you do that, you know, over and over again on a daily basis through through media, right? You get, you know, you manufacture the consent for this response, you know. So it's not it's not necessarily it's it is education on some level, but it's just information. It's like, look, here's the problem. Here's what we have to do, and we would like, you know, we would like your consent or we would like your agreement, and that this is what we're going to do. And so I don't, I don't. I don't think it's that hard. I just think that it has to be a, an aligned um, message, right? You know, if, you, if the media and the government are saying, here's the problem, this is what we must do in the face of the problem, I think you can manufacture that consent. You can say, you, you can have most of the population go, okay, you know, sure, that's, um, that sounds logical to me, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I mean, I think the evidence of this last year is if you look at, say, the Trump phenomena, is that humans seem to be hardwired to split 50-50. So if, if, I think if the government came down and said, look, things are really bad and um, uh, we need everybody to pull together, I mean, half the country in America would say, oh, this is a big conspiracy and basically sure. this is what you... It's basically, it's going to split like everything does 50-50. Mm -hmm. So I think that that kind of proposition winds up in deadlock. If, uh, if people get now, that's if you're told that the situation is dire. So if the captain of the ship says, uh, the situation is dire, well, you say, well, well, that's, you know, the Republican captain of the ship, the Democrat <laughs> says right. something else or something. And then, so it, it dissolves like that because it's coming, coming from an authority. Now, what happens if you have no authorities and societies basically get hit by something which everybody knows is a real disaster, like a hurricane or volcano or... Uh, an earthquake or something, then they respond very, very well. People are, come together very quickly. They're very altruistic and they manage themselves very well. But it's only if it's a shared external threat. Right. Now, this is the shared internal threat. It's us that are making this problem. So it's naive to think that we will pull together to solve our own psychology. So it's way beyond an engineering fix. It's way beyond a technical fix. It's way beyond a political fix. It's a psychological fit. It's a psychological issue. And the minute you have one authoritarian saying we have to change our psychology, half the people are going to say by evolution, you know, we've evolved to say like, oh, well, screw you. <laughs> That's right. what you think. But I've got a different psychology and it's just as good as yours. And basically you're at loggerheads. So it's, it doesn't work the same way with an internal threat, which is our own psychology. We, we are our own worst enemy and we're fighting against ourselves. So if it's an external threat, like a meteor coming towards the earth, then somebody would say, you know, doesn't matter who it is. Biden can get on a platform and say there's a meteor coming towards the earth and everybody will rally because right. it's an external threat. So, but in general here, there's the one fundamental difference I have with, with Roger Hallam is this, this automatic assumption that intervention is good and you need a powerful state to actually do this intervention. He says that, well, it all comes from the social science that he's been studying and that, well, it's, it's like, there's no consensus on that. If you look at Rebecca Solnit and the anarchist tradition says the exact opposite. Kropotkin and, and people, anarchist tradition and I think there's a lot more at the anarchist point of view. And that says that basically, if you take the state out of the way, people do a hell of a lot better. It's a state narrative and it's an authoritarian narrative that says, you need us. You need us to help you with this problem. Right. You say, well, when the state actually does intervene and COVID is an example, is when they do intervene, they make a wreck out of it. When they don't intervene, then everybody goes, but there's no one in charge. Well, it's actually better there's no one in charge. So think of COVID, right? People don't run this through. They think, what happens if the government wasn't there? Well, I think, I mean, that's a counterfactual, so it's hard to run the experiment. But I think that we would have handled COVID better without the government. You'd say, well, airlines would have gone bust and stuff. And say, yes, but they should have gone bust. Right. Say, but, you know, we, would have, we wouldn't have had quarantine. Yeah, we would. Because... I'm telling you, on the island where I'm here in Greece, they would have said, ah, this is nothing to do with Greece, and basically we can carry on as normal. They would have been right. The economy would have been fine. 
then the first few cases you get, people would have been in hysterics and they said, well, we're not going out. And that would have been fine too. But you see, people don't trust nature and they don't trust the natural course of events. But when it's all said and done, I think that the natural course of events, if they just let the disease run it as it is, let humans respond to it as they do, you know, hysterical in one instance and overreacting and rumors. And <clears throat> right. It, it would, when you do the final accounting, say, you know, it was just better to leave it. So I think that ultimately what Rebecca Solnit says, if you look in these situations like the San Francisco earthquake, if you look at, say, Katrina, you look in the wake of those disasters, it's the state that causes all the problems. Mm. It, it's not obvious at the time because everybody loves it. They think this is great. We've got somebody in charge. Say, so, yeah, but when you look at it afterwards, centralized control and that person in charge actually cause more of a disaster and unnecessarily so than just letting things run their course. Well, what do you think about uh, so it's hard to know what's really happening because of the the state of the information coming out of China, but let's say, you know, let's juxtapose China's reaction to coronavirus to the U.S.'s reaction. There, you know, they were, you know, they went full author authoritarian lockdown and, you know, on some levels, squashed, right? They were like, we, because we have the power of the state, wham, you know, we're just going to jump on it. We're going to smother it. And, you know, uh, human, civil rights be damned, right? So, and I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure there are lots of problems with that. You know, I, I'm, I'm positive there are. However, the, the upshot is, you know, do they have, is the virus really there? Do they have really a, an issue now? Or do they, they get, you know, they, they got to the other side of the problem much, much quicker, you know, and, uh, but, but did they? You see, okay, I don't want to get too dark here, but if you take, I don't want to get too pentilincola or like eco-fascist. Right. But if you take, you know, if you're thinking small and you think, well, we've got to handle this virus and you're thinking very <coughs> command and control and you're thinking in a combative way, then we've got to combat this virus. There is a bigger point of view that says, look, the virus is trying to tell us that human, here we have densities of populations that are unhealthy. We've got too much communication around the world. We, the, the whole world is too coupled. The economy is too coupled. <clears throat> and so you can take the rather dark view to say that basically this is nature's way of correcting the balance. And so if you sure. let a disease yeah. like this run its course, you might have an overall better outcome. So think of China as an example. So then Wuhan is <clears throat> locked down they basically get rid of the problem. Well, what happens? They go back to creating greenhouse gases again. Right. See, it was like, I don't think we're getting ahead here. <laughs> right. I think it would have been better if basically it had been in, you know, they, they hadn't managed it. Yeah. You know? Right. Well, that, I mean, that opens up a whole other, uh, you know, a whole other discussion, I think. And that is, you know, is humanitarianism good for humans? Right. The, this idea that we have to we ought, we have to <laughs> save ourselves and, and do the best things for ourselves all the time and other people is it is it really good for humans or is you know and I I'm I'm jumping out I'm you know I'm I'm putting myself out on a on a and a gangplank and I know that people are going to want to push me off but is a more brutal society on some levels or or is or is or is a society that just you know, is more open to the the um, the harshness of nature and nature's laws, right? Is that better in the long run for humans, right? So, are are human? I'm not talking about a Logan's Run scenario where everybody you know gets dies at 30. You know that not not that. I'm just saying, you know, diseases take their toll and take their course, and that's you know we're not going to fix you, we're not going to save you, we're not going to you know. Like, because nature is the ultimate authority, right? You know, I don't know. You know, I'm just putting that so, out there so, as an idea. I'm not saying this is what I think or how I feel like we should run ourselves. I'm just saying, is humanitarianism bad for humans? Uh, so, yeah, in, in part. So I'll join you out on the gangplank and say this. <laughs> that we, we are really, 
uh, we have all these systems and modules, psychological and interpersonal and stuff, uh, that are being misapplied. We really evolved for, you know, Dunbar number, basically from 150 to 250 people. So caring and humanity is not bad, but it's supposed to, it, it, caring and humanity was evolved for your immediate 250 neighbors. It wasn't evolved for China and, you know, basically Europe and all these countries, which are really abstractions. So basically applying something that is meant to be for kith and kin and stuff, and then applying it to these great scales of billions of people and saying like, you know, humanitarian, the humanitarian instinct was never meant to be applied to billions of people. So from that point of view, we're completely out of kilter as, as a human animal. Yeah. So we, we're trying to do too much. And so basically, we need a bit of humi humility and say, look, we're way out of, uh, out of our depth for what we evolved to handle. Right. So rather than having, you know, some of these guys who are in power and basically global power brokers like Putin and Xi Jinping and stuff, <clears throat> it's like, rather than having those people use technology to exercise their power, the plane and the telephone and the internet and stuff, is rather just be humble and say, look, guys, we're completely out of our depth. We've, we've got to scale back. We can't control these, these forces. We can't control our, our own uh, forces. And, and we, we created this, this pandemic. I mean, hunter-gatherers never, never got pandemics. This, this is a consequence of global connected society. So, sure. so we're completely out of our depth. We, we're suffering the symptom of overreach in terms of what we are capable of as, a, as an organism. Sure. And so we should, we should scale back and just say, okay, overreach, <laughs> we, right. we've got to pull back. Instead, we're doing the opposite, saying we're so far in this already that we're going to go the extra hog and now we're going to manage the freaking weather. And you say like, well, yeah. look at the track record of what we managed so far. We've, we made a complete balls up of stewardship of the earth. So right. it's a complete mistake to then go and say, well, we've completely balls it up, but we can do it if we just manage the extra thing. It's like, well, you haven't, you, you kind of flunked the basics and now you want to manage in such fine detail, eventually you're managing the coral reefs, you're managing right. every aspect of, of the world. And it's, it's fine, but it's getting complex and it's getting very, very brittle. So and it's, and it's the gonna, next shock to come and, along, it's going to fall apart. Yeah. Right. Well, and they're 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 trying to make that control even more complex as we speak, right? I mean, I just I just read an article this morning about uh, organic what they're called they're called xenobots, basically organic programmable organic matter. <laughs> ah, like. You know, so, it was, and they're saying these, these, these xenobots could go and clean up the ocean. And I'm like, all right, yeah, you know, all of our, you know, just our technological advances, if we could see the sum total of the results of our technological advances, we would be like, what, you know, oh, hell no, you know, absolutely not. You know, just, can we, yeah, exactly, can we stop? Can we just stop? trying to you know make things more complex and more it could be because the result every single time of like here's this new great thing and it, the result every time is like oh that wasn't so great you know that wasn't maybe not we can fly now awesome we can fly we can well, go anywhere we want oh you know the result of that is eh, not me, uh, yeah maybe that's not so it, good it, it, it's, it's a symphony of unforeseen consequences so if you look at something like the motor car the motor car was considered a great breakthrough because you know the horse and buggy in places like new york was just like filling up with manure people couldn't barely move for right. manure and it was becoming a big problem and then from a very quick period up until say about 1910 suddenly all the horses in new york were replaced by cars and everybody thought well that's that problem solved right and nobody Nobody really thought through as well. Hang on a minute. What's what's the next limit we reach? Well, it was CO two, right? It was uh, basically greenhouse gases and global warming. So the unforeseen consequences always multiply. So if you get one solution, uh, then you you wind up with four new problems. Right. Now in the past, economists said that's great. 
that's more jobs for everybody. <laughs> but you're going to run out of jobs for everybody to do. After you're managing the genetics, you're managing the genetics of the plants and the animals on this, uh, on this planet, and then you're managing the weather and you're managing all the, the, the forest systems or the natural systems or every, every aspect of the world is micromanaged. Right. And each time these guys give a solution and get three more problems, it's getting Byzantine. You, you're going to collapse like the Ottoman Empire because it, it, it just gets more and more complex until it becomes unwieldy. Uh, and yeah, look, look what the answer to, to cars is. Not, not taking cars off the road. We need better cars. We need different kind of cars. We need electric cars. We need hybrid cars. We need, you know what I mean? Like it just... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, I, I'm trying to make the point that technology doesn't allow you to break through limits, right? It allows you to switch limits. Right. So, so then you take the thing like electric cars. They say, well, okay, we've reached the limit with, you know, internal combustion engines. Well, then we all become electric. And that's solved. It's like, no, you've got to tell me now what the new limit is. I'll tell you what the new limit is. One of them is silver. That's why right. I'm trying to get people to do a silver squeeze. Because what they're doing is they're trying to hide these limits. So silver is a definite limit on this renewables and transition and stuff. Yeah. But they're hiding it. And one of the ways they're hiding it is JP Morgan and stuff is manipulating the silver market ridiculously oh, low. They've been, they've been doing it for like 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, But it, the reason is because they, they're trying to, they, they see the, the green renewables uh, the, it's basically a big green rush. They're seeing that big green rush is a huge windfall. So, right. so they know that it can't happen without cheap silver. So they, they're setting everybody up for a fall because now Tesla's stock is to the moon because everybody says, well, everybody's going to be driving around in electric cars soon. So Tesla's market cap is with the whole world. It's so like, well, no. If you go back and say, if silver, as soon as the silver starts running out, it's going to be marked to market as its real value. And it's quite rare, especially if demand goes through the roof. So Tesla is never going to get to where everybody thinks because they're just not looking at the raw materials, cobalt, copper, silver, Lithium, all of these right. things, which yep. they, they, you know, they're using paper to force down silver. Well, there's no limit in paper, but there's a limit in silver. Mm -hmm. So you've got to basically look at the next limit. Whenever anybody comes through with a breakthrough technology, people should be, a lot more critical and say, okay, what's this thing's limits and what are the likely foreseen and unforeseen consequences? Nobody says that. They go, hey, we've got the solution. <laughs> right. like, sure. No, you haven't. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's the way technology always works. It's like, you know, we've got the next thing. We've got the next step. We, here we go. We're, we, I mean, it's almost like um, there is no, you know, they don't actually – ask people is this okay or should we do this or there's never a you know is this a good idea no it's just like here we go we've got the next thing and we've got the next technology and you know it's going to be great breakthrough you know it's always it's going to be good it's going to be better for humanity and we're on the right path and we're going down the right road and um but, but you notice the in that narrative that um they they never ask the public consensus for the really important shit. So the really epochal things that are really going to affect us as a species, things like genetic engineering of plants and animals and ourselves. Now that is an important departure. That's probably one of the most important departures that we've had in our evolutionary history. And lo and behold, we don't get to have a single bit of a say in that. We don't right. even get to debate that. I mean, you know, like what was Prop 401 or something with GMO crops and stuff in California? And they just railroaded that through. You remember that, the GMO labeling? <laughs> oh, right, yeah. They weren't allowed to even label things. So, so the really important shit, like fertility and genetic engineering and population and um, all the, you know, basically geoengineering will be one. You, you won't sure. get to have a referendum on whether we should geoengineer right. the planet. Right? Abs absolutely. They're just going to go, this is the, you know, and I, and I see... So I see why, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot of talk about the Great Reset and Carl Sh Sh Schwab and the World Economic Forum and their whole, you know, oh, this is going to be, Schwab, here's Schwab, our, Schwab. our, you know, our answer to climate change is going to be, you know, this. 
and I, and I see why there's a lot of concern around that, you know, and uh, uh, around that, you know, hey, we've got the answer, you know, is that really the answer? Uh, you know, that answer is, is going to require a lot more control, you know, uh, and a lot and a lot more complexity and a lot more technology and a lot, you know, all, all of those things. Um, and all of that is tied into, you know, the, the burgeoning AI, you know, develop, rollout development, right? You know, there is all going to be, there's going to be robots and people are going to have implants and people, you know, are going to have xenobots, you know, and, na and nanobots and, and uh, smart dust and, you know, all that, all this like quantum, you know, all this amazing technology that's actually already developed, but they're going to tell you like, guess what? You know, it's like. It's like geoengineering. It's like the thing they're doing at Harvard. Well, guess what? We're, you know, we're going to send up this balloon and do this test, right? Like they don't, haven't already tested it. Like they don't already know the results. They already know the results. They've already done it. They've got it fully worked out, you know, but they're going to let you know, like, we're about to test it. We're going to see what happens, you know, okay, you know. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I don't like uh, any of these things. But So what, what's interesting if you look at Scopex and all these things like the, you know, the great resets, the, what's, I think people are gradually starting to realize now something which even a year ago was a ludicrous conspiracy theory. And this is a real point of departure I have with Roger Hallam is the, the guys behind this are all financiers. These are, right. these are bankers. These are central bankers. These, these are the, the rich money people. And, and it used to be a kind of a thing where people would go, yeah, yeah, who, you know, the golden rule, whoever has the gold makes the rules. And, and, it, and you would be a nutty conspiracy theorist to say, you know, central bankers rule the world. But I think now people are starting to see it. These big initiatives are, you know, basically it's clear that Roger Hallam is wrong and XR as a movement is wrong, is the politicians don't really have much power. They, they only have the power to keep growth going. That, that, that is, they one trick ponies. But they can't. They can't do degrowth. De that's that's beyond the power of a politician because the politicians really serve these financiers. Right. And these financiers only want growth, and the, the reason for growth is uh, return on on uh, debt. It's basically interest on debt. It's basically that's how capitalism works. It's a debt-based system, and so the the economy has to grow to basically give a, a return on capital is basically nobody invests in anything that doesn't give a capital return. And yeah. so, so everything has to give a capital return. And now they're starting to say, well, the wildlife has to give a capital return. You say, well, no, it's a disaster to make the Serengeti uh, pay for itself on the open markets. That's open markets crash. And to, you know, we, we don't have a right to get the lions and the antelopes and say, now nah, you've got to pull your weight on the, you know, on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Right. It's like, what, what happens if the price of that uh, falls to zero? Well, then the price of a lion and a leopard has fallen to zero. And it's like, I don't think uh, that works that way. The lions are not only, it's anthrop anthropocentric to say that we have that kind of control and that kind of right to, to, to talk about other animals that way. Right. But we, the, the fact that we can determine their worth, and if they go to zero, we say, oh, we might as well make them go extinct because they're really worthless. That's what the market says and the market rules. I think it's crazy, crazy notion. We don't want to be here. Right. Well, and, and we, you know, everything is commodified. Um, so it's only, yeah, yeah it's only uh, valuable in, in as much as we can use it <clears throat> to produce something or, or make something or, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I think the, the financiers that are behind all this, you know, they, there's a, a limited amount of understanding, I, I think on their, I mean, maybe they understand that we're screwed. They understand we're screwed too. And they're just going to try and milk what they can out of the rest of the time we have. And, and I, you know, that's. I think that's a given, but, uh, you know, I don't know what, you know, what, the, what is the end, the end run to this is what, I mean, it's just almost like, a, it's almost just like a leap into the abyss, you know, like we're, you know, they're just gonna, 
you know, put forward more, more control and more capitalism and more growth. And, well, and that's why I think it's, it's kind of funny to me that, you know, this idea that Bill Gates has a eugenicist agenda, like, you know, Bill Gates is a money person. He understands that, you know, getting rid of people doesn't fit into growth capitalism. Like that's the reason why China stopped having a one child policy wasn't because it was bad or because people didn't like it. It was because it didn't fit the capitalist growth paradigm, right? So they, they implemented this at a time when they were more, you know, when they were actually about communism, right? And they saw the inherent dangers of having too many people and they saw how that could stress, you know, uh, er everything out, the environment and, you know, uh, resources, et cetera, right? But then when they s suddenly decided to become capitalists and have a, a capitalist economy, they were like, well, you can't do, if you're limiting the number of, of consumers, you can't have this one, ch you know, you can't have a limits to growth, you know, because there's no limits, you know, having limits to growth in capitalism doesn't work either, you know? Yeah. I, not in the I, system uh, we have, well, not well, in the capitalist You've raised two points there. Both of them I put my tinfoil hat on quickly. Okay, because, okay. go because, for it. Uh, in, in China, I don't think China has actually... I, I get the impression that they haven't given up on communism. They're basically just using a capitalist model for growth, but it's temporary and they're still on the communist agenda. They assume that when they get hegemony over the entire globe, then they will move back towards a socialist system and then a communist system. So I, I, I think we're getting caught up in our own narrative um, saying that, oh, they abandoned communism and now they're all good state capitalists. I'm, I'm not seeing that. Um, I, I, I'm seeing that basically they're sticking with communism. They just have a very long-term view and we, we can't imagine such a long-term view. So we think they will capitalists. So what what do you think their long-term view is? Is it just, to, you communism know, yeah but Global i mean but i mean is it yeah. are they doing that by becoming maybe the, the 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 capitalist power of the planet and then yeah yeah if, if they become the the global he hegemon right then they can dictate uh the system to the world just like america dictated capitalism to the world over the 20th century they can do the same and dictate communism over the 21st what do you think the role of global uh, financial entities or, you know, what we would call the military, industrial, oligarchical, you know, vampire squid, like what does that have, what role does that have in, in, in China's plans, if that's their plans, like, do they all merge and, you know, does it all become a capitalist thing or does one fight off the other? I, I don't, you know. I don't know because I see I see the I see the the capitalist like the globalist control of the of the planet right, um, the World Economic Forum the 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 International Monetary Fund all of those uh, that huge control mechanism. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost you a little bit there, Lord Lord Hugh. How you doing? Are you back? Okay. Are you back? Uh we lost you a little uh, bit. Ran out of two seconds, but I'm, I'm on um, hanging on the thread. Okay. Lost you a little bit there. Maybe there's a limits to limits to video growth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, no, there's a limit to my uh, battery on my phone. I was on oh, 4G. Oh, I got it. Yeah. So now, now I'm on the Marina Wi-Fi, but it's like really really slow okay <laughs> all right well i can hear you now though so that's good okay well so my my question was what is uh if that's china's long game how does that equate with the long game of the the global you know financial military industrial complex and their you know it's, their quest for global domination it, it's not that different i mean if you look at like the conspiracy theories what they say about the one world order and stuff it does look very much like communism but I've, I've always believed there isn't much different i always believed in the horseshoe theory that if you could look at the extreme left and the extreme right they sound pretty close so sure. if you if you're looking at state authoritarian systems then there's not much difference between 
the World Economic Forum, the BIS, the Bilderbergers and all these guys, they, their vision of, you know, they're Neoplatonists. They, they, they're riffing off Plato's Republic. And part of Plato's Republic was the golden lie that you, you know, you, you pretend that you're democracy, but you have um, all the wise behind the scenes pulling the strings. Sure. And I think that's pretty much how, you know, totalitarian communism and totalitarian fascism and totalitarian capitalism, it, it, it works with, you know, it's, it's basically nations would dissolve into a United Nations. The, the, the dream of the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations after World War I was that basically the statehood thing doesn't work. So it was almost an anarchistic view, even mm -hmm. though anarchists are always the traditional enemy. They did say we, we have to unify. So basically the unification of Europe and the unif unification of all these spheres of influence. They are converging on the same thing as a one world order. And, um, you know, right. <clears throat> both of them under a, an elite. Um, yeah, but I, I don't think any of them get there because I think basically we get a blue ocean event and the methane dragon <laughs> goes off in the Arctic. I don't see this. We can't get there. It's uh, we've missed. It's a it's a <clears throat> yeah. And I, I agree. I think it's a race for time <clears throat> as to whether they can actually implement this like total control system, but they're already, you know, they're already trying. And the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, the brick wall behind the curtain of, of democracy is our, is being revealed now because, you know, we were, we were talking about censorship before the show and, you know, now they're, they're, they're basically kind of coming out in the open and, and, uh, in a totalitarian way, censoring what people can talk about and what they can say. Right. And you have people in Congress right now saying that, you know, we've got to clamp down on this domestic terrorism. Right. So anybody, you know, this is just what was already, you know, in the Patriot Act and Obama as well. Kind of encoded this language, you know, that that made it easier for uh, the, the power structure to kind of, you know, put people away, basically, who were not, you know, seen as dangerous or seen as, you know, a threat. And now that now there's out in the open, you know, kind of coming out in the open with this, you know, like language and the sense, you know, outright censorship of people who are uh, saying anything that's anti style you know, anti-establishment narrative, right? And uh, so everyone's now a QAnon, everyone's conspiracy theorist, everyone is, you know, everyone is a fascist, right? But they're they're gonna, you know, get rid of all the fascists by being super democratic about it, <laughs> and and uh taking away your rights to say anything, you know, anything freely. Yeah, so. it, it, it's 1984, basically, everybody's a criminal, they just whether decide whether to prosecute you or not. But, right. Yeah, so this is where my, the other side of my tinfoil hat comes on is, <clears throat> is, uh, you know, now that I think we have hit the, the wall, we've basically run run out the run out of time then is how, how much do they know that and how much are they just going through the motions and i think uh on my bad days i think that ever since the limits to growth in like 1972 i think it, it very, the signs are if you go back and look at maggie thatcher's speech to the un in 1989 if you look at the trajectory the one there, there was a big inflection point round about maggie and ronald reagan and i think that at that time they made a decision that round about the fall of the Soviet Union, they they made the decision that we screwed and there's nothing we can really do about it long term. I, th I think I, I don't have a lot of evidence for that, but that's what my gut feel says. And so I think what they're doing now is basically they're just doing panic management and running out the clock. So the agenda of the one percent and that is is, uh, you know, they're still on track to have global hegemony and a one world order but and you know one world government but it's 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 a kind of nihilistic fatalistic last days of the titanic kind of initiative sure i i, I mean they, they have all the information at their fingertips and they have more of a complete view than any of us and if you look at their actions i think the only thing that makes sense is that they know that 
And it's the only narrative that really makes sense. And so. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, 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 I see you're breaking up quite a bit. I just want to ask you one more question, and I think we'll we'll have to cut it. Uh, do you see? Do you think there's a chance for people to maybe strike out on their own and maybe get outside of the system as things go forward, kind of like in a Hunger Games style, right? So there there might be, you know, and maybe Hunger Games isn't really a good analogy, but because they did have kind of control of all the sectors, but I think, you know, do you think people will be able to maybe? go out into the woods or go out into the what's left of the wilderness and kind of create their own communities outside of you know what's what what will become you know the the totalitarian state no <laughs> not a chance so all I right think that's a very awesome narrative <laughs> yeah. but uh no reason i say that is because i coming from south africa the they went out of their way to round everybody up out of the bush. So what, what happened in South Africa is after the Battle of Blood River, when really, you know, whites uh, took over the country um, definitively and defeated the, the causes on the Zulus. Um, uh, what the, immediately then they started to industrialize the country and grow it and they needed labor. So they, you know, after all the, the black guys were defeated, they, they were like, say, okay, well, you, and we, we're just heading off for the hills. We have a very nice life with a little, a little crowd somewhere. We grow, you know, substance, subsistence crops and we have a very nice life and screw you. And the, you know, the white guys needed people down the mines. Now the mine is a hell of a place to work. It's um, yeah. Yeah, only slaves will work down the mine. And so they say, yeah, basically, well, can we give you money? And they say, no, that's white man's crap. <laughs> the black guys saw through money straight away. They, they weren't taken in by it like right. we are. And, um, and so, so then they, they had to force them to use money. And the way they did that was they just did taxes. They did, you know, roof taxes and poll taxes and dog oh, yeah. taxes. And they, it just forced people off the land. And so right. you can go off the land and you can go off and prep and stuff, but only as long as they don't need you. Or, or you're not a threat yeah. to the system. As soon as you're a threat to the system, they'll come out and get you. So, so what I'm saying to people is, no, you've got to stay in place and fight. You've got to fight where you stand, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think that people need to, you know, with as, as much time as we have left, keep, you know, uh, keep speaking the truth and keep trying to, you know, call out the power structure for what it is and what it's doing um, and keep trying to educate people as much as you can, you know, it's, 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 it's going to get harder. Well, yeah. yeah. Preparing them, preparing them and helping people to adapt, I think is, is where people particularly, you know, like you and me, that the kind of understand where things are. <laughs> In, in navigating oh, this this road ahead, not not to any kind of solution, but just just for adaptation, just helping make it easier for people. Sure, sure, mm. I agree with that. Well, it's been a very doomy conversation, Lord Hugh. <laughs> 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 thanks, thanks for hanging out. I I you know I don't know if we really got to the crux of the actual topic we were we were going to discuss, but I think we covered a lot of ground, and I think we covered. Uh, you know, I, th I think we covered a lot of pertinent information uh, that maybe people can can chew on. And uh, but I, but again, I appreciate you uh, uh, posting what you posted on the comment section and and giving your two cents. And uh, it's always an interesting conversation to have with you. So uh, thank you. Yeah, just keep up the good work. You're doing such a good job and churning stuff out. Thank you. It's really it's great. It's great. I Love appreciate your stuff. That. Yeah. I appreciate it. Well, let's do it again soon, okay? Yeah, I'd love to. All right. Okay, Kevin, take care. Thank you. Take it easy. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out today for this kind of uh, impromptu conversation with Lord Hugh.
just going to read a couple of comments before we go, guys. Uh, thanks, Tim. I appreciate that. Thanks for hanging out with us. Good to see you in the chats. Uh, Remy Car Carone says, the guest told us how to solve the problem, but none of us actually wants to solve it because we are all lazy humans on the march to our extinction. Uh, thank you, Osama. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks, TCR. I'm going to go say hi to the people on Rockfin for a second. Everybody's still here. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Poppy. Thanks for hanging out. We have Osama, Kevin Shanholzer, Poppy Davis, Nicole Herr. Nicole Herr says, large mammals more likely because they can move to other climates easier. True. True. Um, who else do we have on the Rockfins? I think that's it today on the Rockfins. Nicole Herr, thanks for hanging out with us on the Rockfins. We have 15 people watching on the Rockfins. That's not bad at all. Not bad at all. All right, guys. And we have a tip from Brent McKinney on the Rockfin. Rockfin tips are greatly appreciated. Um, thanks so much, Brent McKinney. And thank you for the super chats on, we've got some super chats from Muzza today on YouTube. And I can't really go back far enough to see the other ones. But we did get a few super chats today on YouTube. Thank you guys for all the support. All right, guys, until next time, peace.